Oregon's got another 2025 commitment. He might be the center of the future, like future, future. You are Locked On Ducks, your daily podcast on the Oregon Ducks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, it is that time once again for Locked On Ducks. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day and your number one source to stay up to date with the Ducks, which is why if you have not already, please like, comment, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to or watch this show, which today is brought to you by our friends at FanDuel. Make every moment more as the playoffs wind down, the sports stop sporting like we want them to, but this summer, FanDuel's hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. Lots to get to. The Michigan betting line came out, and I think that's Oregon's most important game of the season. I'll explain why. And what is the value of a crystal ball nowadays? Well, clearly there's still some value in it because there were crystal balls for Oregon's latest commit, Alai Kalaniuvalu. I think I got that just about right. Four-star offensive lineman becomes the third guy in the trenches on the offensive side of the ball to commit in the class of 2025. Comes from Bishop Gorman High School, which along with Liberty is the best high school for recruiting talent in the Las Vegas area. The last visit that he took was to Oregon. He was a part of that June 21st big visit crowd, and he was there, and he's committed and becomes the third offensive lineman Oregon's got uh, in this 2025 class. Interesting, a couple interesting notes uh, about him and why I feel like he can be the center uh, of the future, but like the long distant future. He's 6'4", 300 pounds. That's what he's currently listed at. 24-7 also has a previous listing of him as 6'3", 275 pounds. So a guy who has altered his body a little bit. He began his career in Utah till about his sophomore year and then transferred down to uh, the Las Vegas area to play at Bishop Gorman. He'll play his senior year this season. But the reason I say he is the center potentially of the future future is... I, I've not been able to confirm, but I believe he is going to take a mission, much like Gatlin Bear, who is also a 2025 uh, blue chip recruit. He's a five-star receiver. Bear will arrive in 2026 because he's class of 2024. So four, five mission, Bear's on campus in 26. Uh, Kalani Uvalu, if he takes his mission right after high school, would be gone five and six and then be on campus for seven. Now, you'd anticipate at that time his body would be pretty darn grown and mature to step in and be an offensive lineman, might need a year or so to get himself into that sort of shape. The good news, though, is that Oregon is set at the center position for the next two seasons. So getting a guy, I think this is why this makes a lot of sense for Oregon to take a guy who is class of 2025 but might not show up until later. Oregon is set at center for 25 and maybe even 26. Because Poncho, who Iapani Laulu, is going to be Oregon's starting center this year and next year because he can't leave to go to the NFL. And then if he does, then Oregon needs a center for 26. But if he comes back for his fourth year, then Oregon is set at center for the next three years. And then Kalani Uvalu can uh, try to work his way into the fold. But uh, began his high school career in Utah playing tackle, but projects as a center per the 24-7 sports scouting community. Chose Oregon over, get a load of this list, uh, BYU was in the mix. Utah was in the mix. Those were the Big 12 schools. And then a trio of Big 10 schools. Nebraska, Michigan, USC had all offered, were the finalists, and he chooses Oregon. Now, he has not uh, shifted Oregon's 2025 recruiting rankings. You could view that as he, you know, his his commitment prevents Oregon from falling down one rank from number five to number six, but they are still number five nationally. And he joins a pretty good looking class in 2025, at least, of offensive line recruits. You've got Dimitri Manning, who is the lowest rated player in Oregon's 2025 class. I still think he ends up having some sort of role at the very least as, you know, kind of that jumbo package offensive lineman because he's just such a big guy at 6'6 and a half, 345. 
and Zaire Addison, who has the athleticism to be Oregon's starting left tackle in 2026, would be my guess. Because other than Panay Sewell, we have not really seen a guy even who is a, a big-time blue-chip recruit. Even Josh Connerly did not start at left tackle, and he was the number one tackle in his class for uh, the 2020 two cycle all the years blend together time is a social construct and whatnot but this is a really nice pickup for the ducks and elite terry has proven himself to be a capable recruiter he is a younger guy under 30 years of age and got the the promotion after adrian clem went off to the nfl and oregon's offensive line recruiting really hasn't skipped a beat. This is a top 200 player. He's a top 15 interior offensive lineman in the class, top five player in, in the state of Nevada. And look, I'm always here for guys along the offensive line that have positional versatility because let's say he works himself into being a starter one day. That's a guy who might have to shift around like a Ryan Walk, for instance, played three different positions. And that was tremendously valuable to Oregon when, you know, Alex Forsyth in 2022 was battling injuries. You know, he was able to play guard. He had played a little bit of tackle and he could slide over and play center. Seems like Kalani Uvalu could do that as well. So Greg Biggins of 24 seven sports uh, has the following scouting report quote, Kalani Uvalu played left tackle as a sophomore for Provo, Utah, Tim view before transferring uh, into Gorman and moving to center his likely college position. One of the strongest players in the country, dominant run blocker who can manhandle opposing nose guards and tackles at the high school level, is light on his feet, moves extremely well laterally, and can get to the second level with ease. Now, that's something that stands out to me when I think of great Oregon centers. I'm now going to think of Jackson Powers Johnson, and that's a guy who who seemed like he was always at the second level. Sometimes it was a pin and pull concept where he was running around and, you know, kicking out some poor defensive back that had to try and, you know, basically not break every bone in uh, his body. But uh, I, I think that that sort of movement ability at the center spot and, and just the positional versatility, I think those two things go really well together to make this guy a valuable part of Oregon's offensive line. Biggins goes on to say, uh, has enough length, to him to project as a high-end power four prospect, future NFL player as well, high football IQ player who understands the position, has the football intelligence needed to play and excel at the center position, which is perhaps the most important part. Like, yeah, you have to be big enough. You got to be strong enough. You got to move a little bit. You know, guards uh, sometimes uh, pull, but well, they do a, a decent amount. But you got to have athleticism at all these spots now because of the defensive lineman that you're going up against. I think that, you know, Biggins noting that he's got the the football wherewithal and IQ to play the center position is a really, really intriguing thing. It's not something that I've seen a lot on on scouting reports for offensive linemen, because how can you really, you know, measure that? Like it's a hard thing to measure. You you can see, you know, instincts in a defensive back and the way he reads a quarterback, or a quarterback the way he reads a defense, or how a receiver is able to anticipate what a DB is gonna do and you know sets him up with this move or that move. I, I think that's something that clearly has to stand out. And this could be Oregon's starting center. It's way in the future, but it's a good pickup. And, and I think the timeline can can absolutely work out depending on uh, how Poncho's career ends up going. Let me know your thoughts in the YouTube comments or hit me up on X, formerly known as Twitter or just forever known as Twitter. So the betting line is out for Oregon at Michigan, and it's Oregon minus three and a half. I have thoughts on that, and also why that Michigan game is the most important game on Oregon's schedule. That's coming up next. First, let's get to our friends over at FanDuel. I love sports. That's probably pretty obvious, and I love them so much that I never want them to stop. But as the playoffs wind down, we get fewer games, and the sports aren't sportsing like I want them to. But FanDuel lets me keep the sports going whenever I want. All I have to do is open the app and dream up bets quite literally any time that I am in the mood, 24-7, 365. This summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That includes you. All customers. Not just new customers, all customers. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. The Oregon line I'm about to talk about at Michigan is Ducks minus three and a half. They are plus one and a half at home against Ohio State, and they have a win total of 10 and a half, which is tied for the highest in all of college football. Not too shabby. 
Head over to FanDuel.com. Start making the most out of your summer. FanDuel.com, FanDuel, official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. Second segment sips, official sponsor of keeping me hydrated and my mouth avoiding being dry. Okay, so I think Oregon's most important game in 2024 is Michigan. The biggest game is going to be Ohio State, but biggest and most important are not the same. Here's what I mean. When you look at Oregon's schedule, 10 wins minimum is what is required to get into the college football playoff. Because if you're a nine win team, you're probably not playing for a big 10 championship and can't get the auto bid. And nine and three with this Oregon schedule, I don't think gets you into the 12 team playoff. So 10 wins is the minimum standard. 11 guarantees you a spot in the playoff. If Oregon goes into the big house where they're a three and a half point favorite and beats Michigan, to me, they will be a lock for the playoff. Now, do upsets happen? Sure. We've seen it happen many a times in college football. That's why you play the games on the field, not on paper. If Oregon is able to go into Michigan and do what Vegas thinks they should do, win the football game, then to me, they're not going to have a problem going to Purdue, even though that's going to be an improved Boilermakers team that has had a propensity to pull upsets over the years. That's the week after Ohio State. Michigan State's the week before. That's at home. I'll never pick against Oregon at home because, gosh, I just don't lose there uh, very often. I mean, if Georgia came to town, okay, sure, maybe, but anybody else? Eh, it's really hard to win at Autzen Stadium. I think Ohio State's going to learn that lesson, but I haven't made any official predictions yet on, on any Oregon games because prediction season is August. This is speculate about prediction season predictions come in August. So you've got the Ohio State game. That'll be the biggest one. But if Oregon's able to go and win at Michigan, I don't see them losing two other games on their schedule. And even if they do, I don't see them losing three other games. I suppose it's a better way to make my point. If they're winning in Ann Arbor at the big house, if it's a repeat of 2007, what a glorious day that was. If it's a repeat of 2007, blow out of the big house style, or if Oregon just gets any sort of win, I could see him theoretically losing two other games on the schedule. That would probably be Ohio State at home for sure. And either an upset at Purdue and lose two games in a row. Probably not uh, at Wisconsin would probably be the other game that, you know, Oregon would certainly have to fight their way through. And let's say they lose, but that would be it. So that Michigan game to me ensures that Oregon makes a playoff. And I think if Oregon beats Michigan, there's a high likelihood that they're winning 11 games in 2024. And that to me sets them up as a playoff lock. Cause if you're 11 and one, you're playing for the big 10 championship. I don't think there's a scenario where Oregon loses just one. I don't think they're losing any of their non-conference games. I saw that Boise state was picked as the preseason favorite in the mountain West heavily. So, and understandably so, but no, I don't think Oregon's going to lose that game at home uh, to to the Broncos there, who have been a nemesis in in Oregon side, to be fair. But Dan Lanning doesn't know that. So, or maybe he does, but he doesn't care. So, if Oregon wins 11 games, I don't think they can be left out of the Big Ten championship game. And then regardless of whether or not they win, like let's say Oregon loses to Ohio State twice. Let's say it's a repeat of Washington from, from last year. Lose tight in the regular season in heartbreaking fashion and then get outplayed in the conference championship game. And Oregon sitting there at 11-2 and two with a win at Michigan, at Wisconsin, against Washington, Oregon State, Boise State. You know, there'll be eight, nine win teams or so with, with, with Mountain West plus schedules. And, you know, maybe somebody like Maryland or Illinois is okay. You're getting in the playoff. You're, you're getting into the playoff. Now, if you lose the Michigan game, suddenly this gets a little bit more dicey. Because if Oregon goes 10-2 and two with losses to Ohio State and Michigan and does not get into the Big Ten championship game, boy, you might need some help getting into the playoff. I, I think they'd have a good chance. I don't know that it'd be a great chance because there's nobody on that non-conference slate that's going to do a lot for you. It would have to be a string of 10 
dominant, wildly impressive victories, which, you know, Oregon had a season ago. But that's going to be hard. And it's one of the things that I'm actually interested to see. Uh, everydayers are aware. Shout out to all the everydayers out there, by the way. Appreciate you very much. Everydayers are aware that I'm not a fan of the 12-team playoff. I think it diminishes the college football regular season. It doesn't reduce it down to nothing, but it certainly takes it from, you know, what it was before, which was a 10 out of 10 to, you know, like a seven and a half, eight out of 10, because certain games won't matter as much. You know, Ohio State, Michigan, the last several years, the regular season matchup wouldn't have mattered. And that, I think, is what has always made college football so special. But one thing I am fascinated to see is how the committee treats a 10 and 2 Big Ten team versus a 10 and 2 Big 12 versus a 9 and 3 SEC. And here's another 9 and 3 Big Ten that played all the heavy hitters. And here's a 10 and 2 ACC. What do they do with those at large spots? Because I think there are more guaranteed spots in the playoff than people realize. I think you've got. Uh, well, I know that you've got the four, the five auto bids to the five highest ranked conference champions and the group of five, God bless them, um, getting an auto bid into the playoff is so patently absurd. All auto bids are stupid, by the way. But if you want to have that debate with me, I am or just agree with me. I'm so here for it. Auto bids are stupid and make no sense. But we have them anyway, because the wrong people are on college football, namely not myself and Josh Pate. Anyway, so if, if you look at what, what the playoff structure has, the five auto bids are not the only, they're the only official auto bids, but then there are de facto auto bids. The losers of the Big Ten and SEC championship games who tend to already have 11 or 12 wins, those teams are getting in. So really you have at least seven automatic spots. And then you get into... 10 and 2 SEC team. The SEC is getting a minimum three teams in. So that's eight spots that are filled. And suddenly you've got four for everybody else. And you're going to have nine and three SEC teams. You're going to have 10 and 2 Big Ten teams. You're going to have 10 and 2 ACC and 10 and 2 Big 12 or 9 and 3 Big 12 that have a quality win here or an 11 win group of five team poking their head into the fold. I don't know how the committee is going to handle all of that, but I think Oregon is in a good position overall to put themselves into the playoff. It's why they're one of the shortest betting favorites to make the playoff. They are one of the four. Uh, I will I will double check according to our friends at uh, FanDuel here. I believe they are the fourth uh, shortest odds team to make the playoff. Third. They're the third. They're down to, oh, that's that's crazy. Everybody loves Oregon. They are down to minus 290, meaning you have to bet $29 to make 10 on Oregon making the college football playoff. And I think that faith is reflected in this betting line at Michigan. The big house is a tough place to win. You've got the reigning national champs. Their roster is very different. It's not Washington different. Like Michigan's going into Washington this year in October and they opened as an 11 and a half point favorite. That was too many points. It's come down to eight and a half or nine and a half, which is probably about right. Michigan has a lot more intact from last year's national title team than does Washington. The Huskies are essentially a brand new football team. Michigan is mostly new. And the newest thing about Michigan will be, there is a bug in here that just jumped onto the screen. And I tell you what, it kind of scared the crap out of me. I just wasn't expecting to see anything move. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Anyway, um, I flicked him away. <laughs> that, like, made my heart legitimately jump. I didn't know what was happening. That has not happened before. Okay. Uh, where was I? Michigan and such. I, I think Oregon being a three-and-a-half-point favorite is about the right number because Michigan's got Michigan's gonna have a nasty defense they've got a corner whose name I'm forgetting that's really good Mason Graham the defensive lineman you talk about a test for the interior of Oregon's offensive line that dude is a game wrecker I mean game wrecker absolutely gnarly and that Michigan defense will be good I don't know about their offense though you're not gonna have JJ McCarthy at quarterback turnover along the offensive line I think Oregon might, right now I'd pick Oregon to cover the three and a half points, but 
being in the big house, yeah, it's going to be tough. It's, it's, it's absolutely going to be tough. Let me know your thoughts below on the Michigan game, Oregon minus three and a half in Ann Arbor on November 2nd. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I had, did that off the top of my head, and that's how many times I've looked at Oregon's schedule. I, I think I could do every game in order off the top of my head, or at least pretty close to it. I got a question about crystal balls in recruiting and whether or not they still have value, and I'm going to answer that question because I think it's a really, really good question to ask. Don't be a prisoner of the moment. That's my answer to the question, do crystal balls still matter? YouTube comments or X, formerly known as Twitter, if you want priority access and all sorts of other perks, go join the flock over at Subtext. That is how you get into the mailbag. This question from Sean. Hey, been looking for a while now. Big fan. Keep up the amazing work. Appreciate it. Mailbag question. Do you think crystal balls are becoming more and more redundant as we have seen Oregon completely ignoring them with the likes of Brew and Moore? So, Dorian Brew and DeCorian Moore, five-star Oregon commits in the class of 2025, both had crystal balls elsewhere. Dorian Brew to Ohio State, DeCorian Moore to Texas. Josiah Sharma even had a four-star defensive tackle that Oregon's got in their 25 class. He had a crystal ball to go elsewhere. What I'd say about those predictions, they are right more often than they are wrong. That does not mean you should take them as the gospel for being correct all the time. They're obviously not. What they're reflective of is the last time whoever logs a crystal ball prediction on 24-7 sports or on three, it's the last that that individual heard in that recruiting race. So if a crystal ball gets logged on, say, Tuesday, and the commit is going, the, the player's going to commit the following Wednesday, that crystal ball will stay there. But that recruitment and getting down into the wee hours of decision time, that is going to go down to the wire because schools are going to put on a full court press and do everything they can to get you to choose their school, and that can change. And so one thing that I have been told by a couple of different people is that the Decorian Moore situation was going to be Texas, and Oregon came in in the final 24 hours and put on the full court press. And it worked. And he picked Oregon. So I, I think you can take them as an indicator, but don't take them as, you know, oh, it means they're guaranteed to go there or, you know, whether it's, whether it's to Oregon or elsewhere. I think you can look at those guys and say, man, do these even matter? Yeah, they're, they're still right more, more than they are not. But... It is a good question to ask and something to be aware of for those of you that follow this stuff, frankly, almost or as in depth as I do. Um, I get questions like some some of you out there, Oregon fans, you guys are awesome. You guys are you guys are so so unbelievably awesome. Sometimes I have people send me uh, tweets from from sources about recruiting, and I will see it, and I will be like twenty minutes behind. On, on my Twitter feed, catching up from news off the golf course, and someone will have sent me something, I'll be like, really? Wow, I, didn't, I hadn't seen that yet. And like I was going to see it, but sometimes you guys are just on top of it. So in breaking news, people will send me breaking news stuff all the time. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I mean, you want to make my job easier? Go for it. It's not like I'm not going to see it. I'm going to get to that information one way or the other. But Oregon fans, you guys are awesome. And you ask great questions too, which is why I've got two more to get to here on today's show. This from Drastic underscore MC. Does the type of offenses we've run under Dan contribute to Oregon getting the best receiver in the nation? Yes. Yes, it, it, it does. So getting a guy of DeCorian Moore's stature and, and recruiting pedigree and profile would not have been possible in the Chip Kelly era because Chip Kelly and then Helfrich to a, a, a similar or yeah probably similar extent since you know he was uh, Chip's OC they like to run the football they like to run the football a lot now it didn't project as oh this is a boring offense it doesn't throw the football and, and whatnot because Oregon scored a bunch of points and they were running the spread and the hurry up and all this sort of stuff 
But that style of offense didn't bring in a lot of high-level receiver recruits because number one, big mantra of the Chip Kelly days, no block, no rock. You got to show up and you got to be Josh Huff, Keenan Lowe out there, Johnny Johnson the third, you know, under the Mario Cristobal administration. You got to be moving guys out of the way or we're not throwing you the football. That was, that was just a rule. I'm sure coaches still implement that as part of the rule. But the style of passing has definitely changed to where the ways that receivers get the ball are more myriad, more explosive, and allow guys to put better tape on, on film and play more like receivers. You know, receivers in the Chip Kelly era, yeah, they made some plays here and there. But for the most part, I, I mean, their, their most consistent regular work was an extension of the run game. You know, it was, it was screen passes and RPOs and whatnot. And Oregon does that sort of stuff. But there are a lot more, I think, dynamic downfield concepts that Lanning's offenses have run the last couple of years. And yes, I use the term Lanning's offenses because he's a defensive head coach since he's a former D.C. But I, I have not and will never subscribe to the notion that just because you come from that side of the ball, you have no input on the offense. There have been formations and concepts and schemes that have carried over from the Kenny Dillingham offense to the Will Stein offense. That is not an accident. It is because Dan Lanning is still the head coach. So I think the way that they play, you know, having those explosive plays, giving receivers chances on, on more 50-50 balls down the field, it's not something that you saw a lot in past Oregon offenses for various reasons. But you are seeing it now. And I think that that trend, you know, the offense that Oregon plays definitely, definitely contributes to being able to land a guy like DeCorian Moore or Dallas Wilson, who's a five-star receiver, or Jerion Dickey, Troy Franklin, all, all these guys, they want to go to a place where they're going where, where they're going to play wide receiver, not a blocker who catches passes. And I think there was an element, though there were talented guys in those, you know, early 2010 days. I mean, Josh Huff and Jeff Mail, my favorite Oregon receiver of all time. Give me 10 Jeff Males from now until the end of time, every year on the roster, and I'm happy. But you know, Jeff Mail and Lavazier two and eight, like they, these guys were all good players. Were they Boletnikov caliber talents? No, they they were not. And you see Oregon bringing those guys in because you have thousand yard receivers. That sort of stuff makes an impact. You know, Ohio State's got a reputation as wide receiver. You how they kept recruiting and developing big time players, and then they put up big numbers. I mean, Oregon had not had a thousand yard receiver since 2018 then they had two of them last year yeah guys noticed that sort of stuff so that's a really really good question all right we end with a fun question here this is from moody man 22 fun question for the pod you're a five-star recruit and you want to make a big commitment announcement if you commit on a holiday which one is it and how do you do it well you know decorey and moore's commitment was fun on the fourth of july and all I kind of like the 4th of July, you know, that's probably the one I would go with because I think picking that, that date was really, really fun. And, and that sort of vibe, you know, summer vibes, it's a great time, you know, as a content creator, podcast host, I appreciate a July commitment. It makes shows a lot easier to do this time of year. So I'm going to do that being who I am and knowing what I know about the college football world. Uh, I'm going to do 4th of July. How do I do it? Probably not on an Instagram live stream where I go outside and the Wi-Fi kind of runs out and it you know pauses a couple times like, it's all good. It's all good, Decorian. We're thrilled to have you coming to Oregon. Might have just kept that inside where all the where all the family was, but I understand wanting to go for you know a fireworks sort of theme. Uh, if I were if I were a big recruit, I, I like the hats. I like having the hats on the table. You know, and I mean, I mean, if I were deep down secretly or maybe not so secretly, I'm a little bit of an egomaniac. So perhaps I would put one hat on or not have another hat on. I would 100 percent like if I were 18 years old, I would do the hat and then I have a black jacket on like I'm Luke Skywalker in Return of the Jedi. But then I would take the jacket off and reveal a shirt underneath that matches the hat I pick. I do something like that. Instagram Live is fine. I don't need to do it on 24-7 or such. But anyway, that's a fun question to end today's show. Keep them coming. YouTube comments, X, subtext, it's all available. Formerly known as Twitter. I almost forgot to say X, formerly known as Twitter. What is happening to me? I don't know. Time to leave.
Appreciate everyone listening. I'll see you next time. Have a wonderful rest of your day and go Ducks.